everyone. It's very good to be back here. Uh, I, I gave a tutorial back in 2019 when the world was a different place. Uh, I'm glad there's still a world to come back to and give talks to. So welcome, everyone. Um, with, with these tutorials, it's kind of difficult because uh, there's always a mixed background, right? Uh, some of you out there probably know some statistics and some machine learning and some Python and different combinations of both. So I'm not going to make any assumptions about uh, your background knowledge here. Um, this is meant to be a kind of a high-level overview of Bayesian statistics, probabilistic programming, and, and PyMC. Um, so we won't go in depth into anything. This is kind of just a taste, and um, there's lots and lots of resources out there for you if you want to dig a little bit deeper. Um, as Matteo mentioned, I work for the Philadelphia Phillies, which is a baseball team in uh, the United States. Um, we are hiring, by the way. Uh, we get a good office view, uh, <laughs> unless you don't like baseball, in which case it's kind of an obnoxious view. Um, software developers, quantitative analysts, data engineers, uh, if you can throw baseball 100 miles an hour, relief pitchers we're also looking for, so <laughs> let me know. Um, so probabilistic programming uh, isn't really a new thing. The, the term is kind of new. Um, and and uh, you know, when we talk about a probabilistic program, we're really talking about any computer program whose output is non-deterministic, or it's partially based on the outcomes of random numbers. And so um, really, it can be a, you can do PP in any language that has a random number generator. But of course, um, you know, some choices of language, uh, language are, are better than, than others. Um, and what we're really specifically talking about here, essentially, is uh, a language where there are additional primitives, right? So we're used to primitives in the sense of integers and floats and strings. Um, a probabilistic programming has uh, primitives that are stochastic, so uh, objects that generate random numbers uh, have stochastic properties, um, particularly from you know, known statistical distributions, normal distributions, binomials, things like that. Uh, so you, know, you, can, you could have an object that is a normal distribution. You can draw 100 random values from that. Uh, you can, it can get um, more sophisticated than that. There are distributions over entire functions, like a Gaussian process, where you can draw a function from a, a distribution or distribution over functions and make predictions on that. And then importantly, um, you can con condition uh, one based on the other, right? So you can have a, a variable that's drawn from one distribution and then use that draw to uh, condition the draw of another random variable. So what this does is it allows us to uh, specify statistical models, probability models, at a, at a very high level, right? It's all about abstracting away a lot of this stuff. And the main reason we do probabilistic programming is to facilitate Bayesian inference. And Bayesian inference is probably different than the statistics you may have learned in, uh, at university, although newer programs are incorporating this stuff uh, a little bit more. Um, why should we do what is, first, first of all, what, you know, having said I'd make no assumptions, what is Bayesian inference? What is Bayesian statistics? Uh, this is Andrew Gelman. Uh, Andrew Gelman's definition, and he, he's a prominent Bayesian out of Columbia University. He says, uh, practical methods for making inferences from data using probability models for quantities we observe and about which we wish to learn. So the idea is you build a model using probability distribution. Everything uh, that you are interested in has a, a probability distribution associated with it. And the probabilities that we're talking about here are a little bit backwards from uh, what you might be used to. So, and in fact, Bayesian inference used to be called inverse probability because what we're going to do is we're going to infer from effects to causes. So Y here is some data that you observed. Theta is uh, our unknown quantities, random variables, predictions, whatever you're interested in. And you're going to observe something about the world, and we're going to use that to infer something about the things you're interested in. All right? So it's these conditioning statements that help determine what the causes might be. Um, why? Why would we want to do this? Uh, this is, a again, a definition from uh, Lincoln Barker's book on Bayesian statistics. Um, it's attractive because it's useful. Um, you know, there are sort of philosophical reasons that you might want to be Bayesian rather than frequentist. But um, it, it's, it's very useful. And it's very simple, the, at least uh, conceptually it's very simple. 
Uh, all the pieces are very simple, but it can be used to build something large and complex and interesting. So it's, it's a utility, really, that motivates uh, me. Here's the requisite uh, showing of the Bayes formula, right? So this is what we're doing here. Um, we're going to use probability distributions to characterize what we know and don't know about the stuff we're interested in. Again, and again, theta here are the things we're interested in. It could be one variable, it could be 100 variables, it could be an entire model. And so the idea is you, you have some, some uh, information about the world before you start doing your experiment or your project. And, and that's, we, we encapsulate that in a prior. This is what we know before seeing the data. And then we have some observations, some data uh, that we uh, encapsulate as a, a statistical likelihood. And we use that, the magic of Bayes' formula is that it, 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 we use that to update our information about theta and give us that inverse probability that I talked about before. So after having observed something, what, what can I say about, about theta? And th so this is really just a rule for learning from data, and that's really what machine learning is trying to do all the time. So um, in probabilistic programming, we want to come up with a, a, a program that does this for us, because uh, that's kind of the hard part in Bayesian inference, is the actual calculation of that posterior distribution. And uh, in a stochastic program, what we're doing is we're specifying most of the right-hand side of that equation. So we're going to give it information about our prior, we're going to get information about the data, and you model this kind of joint distribution of your data and, and your unknowns. So let's look at these pieces a little bit. So prior distributions. Um, again, we're trying to quantify the uncertainty in the latent variables before we've, we've seen the data. We may not know much about it. So we, you know, everything has to be given a distribution in Bayes. So we, we might give it a, a normal distribution, which is you know, your bell curve, maybe a mean of zero and a, and a standard deviation of one. Um, it says that we know, essentially, it's somewhere between negative four and four, perhaps. Um, this is also a normal distribution, that line across the bottom. Uh, so normal with mean zero, but a, a standard deviation of 100, so variance of 10,000. It's essentially a straight line in this region. And that means we don't know very much about it, right? It's diffuse, it's uninformative, largely uninformative. Um, often we know something about the system we're studying, right? So let's say something like, I don't know, an infectious disease that ravages the world. Uh, it, its prevalence is going to be low even during a pandemic, right? So a beta distribution describes things between zero and one. So a rate can be either be anything between non-existent to everywhere, zero and one, and even even uh, a prevalent disease is going to be you know 10% or, or less most of the time. So that's a beta 150. So this is again characterizing what we know ahead of time. Then we have the likelihood, the other piece that we're responsible for specifying. How does the data relate to the model? So now we're conditioning on our model, uh, conditioning your model on, on, the observed, on the observed data. And our data can look a lot of different ways, right? So our data is often normally distributed, right? Heights and weights of people. Uh, any sums of other variables tend to be normal because of something called the central limit theorem. Uh, so what we observe, x, sorry, I switched it from y to x. x uh, here could be normal with some unknown uh, mu and, 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 and uh, variance uh, that we need to estimate. Uh, baseball, uh, right? So we have hitters that try to hit the ball uh, in a certain number of tries. So uh, we want to estimate the probability that this uh, hitter might get a, a, a hit in the, sometime in the future. So we're going to use a binomial distribution to describe that sort of data, successes out of a certain number of trials. Uh, let's say you run a website and you're trying to estimate you know, expected numbers of visitors per month. There are likelihoods for, uh, estimate for characterizing counts of things, right? And when that could be you know, up in the tens or hundreds of thousands, right? And so the magic of Bayes is that it's gonna take those two pieces of information, what we know before, some new information, and generate something afterwards. And that, so that funny little symbol in between uh, the two sides of the equation means proportional to, it means equal to, up to, uh, but not including a constant value. And so full Bayes looks like that. And um, 
the, the thing that makes Bayes hard is, the, is essentially the, the probability of y underneath uh, uh, in the denominator of that fraction in Bayes' formula. Uh, that is a kind of a weird thing, probability of y, probability of the data. It's actually the marginal probability of the data. So it's, it's the numerator integrated over all of the thetas. And, uh, you know, I, I, I took calculus in school. I can do integration when there's like one variable. Uh, I think I took a test where I had to do twi two variables. Multivariate integration is very, very hard uh, and um, nearly impossible. And, and particularly in models where you have hundreds or thousands of parameters that you have to integrate over. So it requires numerical methods in order to do it. And that's what probabilistic programming is going to do for us, is it's going to take that inference procedure that's usually very complex and, and tricky and, uh, and um, kind of make it go away. But, uh, you know, like I like to do in, when I teach this in a course, it, it, you can do it by hand for simple problems. And I think it's useful even in a situation like this to, to do this together. So we'll do a simple problem by hand and then we'll look at pi and seat. Uh, so let, I'm going to use, again, a baseball example because I have lots of baseball data. Uh, so uh, I'm going to estimate. So uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the sport, the pitcher throws the ball, the batter's got to try to hit it. And uh, it's very hard to hit a baseball when it's thrown at you at high rate of speed. And so they strike out some of the time. So a strikeout is when uh, you, you take three swings at the ball and uh, you miss. And then you're, you're, you're done and the next batter comes up. And so if we're trying to minimize the uh, strikeout rate of a batter if we're running a baseball team. So we have a player on the Phillies named Nick Castellanos. Uh, he plays right field. And um, back in 2019, um, he, he, he came up to about 22 times to start the season, and he only had one strikeout, which is really low. But of course, you know, 22 plate appearances isn't all that much. You'll, you'll probably have 600 of those during the year. So we want to know, what we want to know is what's his true strikeout, right? What's the underlying truth there? Because you could get that by accident. Um, so the reason we can do this one by hand is uh, a little trick, a little statistical trick called conjugacy. And for certain data, for certain models with certain types of variables, you can do the Bayes formula update without having to do any integration. And in this case, you can because uh, that strikeout data, remember, is binomial, right? It's the number, how many, 22 tries, and he did it once. So that's binomial data. If you put a beta prior on that, and we saw the beta prior for the disease thing, right? It's, it's values between 0 and 1. We're estimating a rate of strikeouts here. We're going to call that a beta distribution. And it turns out, if you combine the two of those, you get a posterior distribution that's also a beta. So that's pretty handy, right? Because you can estimate that and then maybe observe some more data and take the posterior that's a beta distribution and make it the prior the next time and look at some more data. And you can keep do turning the Bayesian crank that way. And so this is what it looks like. A little bit of math here, not too much. This is what a binomial distribution looks like. So theta is our probability of the event. Y are the number of events. Right? And if I just look at the, what I call the kernel of this distribution, it's theta to the y, 1 minus theta to the n minus y. So the number of successes and the numbers of failures and their associated probabilities. Well, the beta distribution looks like this. And if you squint at those, they look really similar, don't they? Theta to the something, 1 minus theta to the something. In this case, the variable of interest is theta. Up there, the variable of interest is y. But they're the same form. So you can squish those together and reduce it, and you end up with another beta distribution. And a beta distribution is parameterized by alpha and beta, essentially the number of prior successes and prior failures. And so it's beta alpha plus the number of observed successes, beta, beta, uh, alpha plus the number of observed successes, and beta plus the number of failures, and minus y. So let's do it. Let's do some Bayes. So this is what 1 of 22 looks like in terms of a likelihood. Right? And, and it implies you know, a strikeout rate that's below 10%, uh, although it could be as high as you know, 30%, and you know, it just kind of happened by accident. Um, we're not sure. Well, let's uh, get a, a, a prior for this. Well, you, how do we get a prior for this? What's our prior? What I did for a prior is I went to uh, my big baseball database, and I pulled out all of the batting data over three years of, of uh, three seasons of playing, and I, I, I took out all the players with over 200 plate appearances, so lots of data, and I got their strikeout rate, 
And in SciPy, there's a big stats library in SciPy, and you can just fit distributions, whichever one you want. Any distribution you call, in this case, beta, because it's a beta distribution, dot fit, and it'll give you the parameter estimates. And that turns out it's a beta 1035. Right. So we can, uh, we've got the formulas to do both. And so uh, the black line over there is our prior. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, or sorry, that's the data. The prior is the dark blue line. And then the posterior is always going to be somewhere between the prior and the likelihood, right? Uh, it's a little bit closer to the, to the prior in this case because there wasn't much data. And now we have kind of a reasonable posterior estimate, right? Uh, we didn't have to choose that prior. We could choose a different one. Um, you know, what if we know a little bit more about baseball? It's like, oh, Castellanos is a right fielder. Different players in different positions have different characteristics. So I'm just going to take the right fielders in my data set, more restricted data set data set to use, and that turns out to be a beta 1547. Okay, and that corresponds to the red here. So now we're, you know, we're hedging our bets a little bit more back towards the prior of a higher strikeout rate because outfielders are big heavy hitters that strike out a lot. Um, right? Which one is right? We're not sure. Um, but the point is you can choose your prior based on, on whatever information you have. And you really want to bring as much information as you can to the table to get the best estimate. The goal here is to get the right answer, not to be statistically pure, right? As long as you tell people what your prior is, as long as you specify it as part of your model, you can argue later about whether or not that was a good choice or not, okay? That's the idea. That's kind of your base by hand. But, um, you know, it, uh, your, your model and your data will quickly outstrip what you're able to do by hand, and you'll have to turn to some software to help you out for bigger models. And, here in 2022, uh, we're extremely blessed uh, with a lot of different um, choices when it comes to doing Bayes, even just in Python. These are just the ones for doing this in Python, right? So PyStan and PyMC, uh, Pyro, NumPyro, kind of the Facebook thing, TensorFlow probability if you're a Google guy, uh, and, and others. There's a whole, there's, I just want to give a, you a subset here, okay? Um, we'll talk about here about uh, PyMC uh, because I work on that project. Um, so PyMC uh, is just for fitting Bayesian statistical models uh, using a variety of methods. There are, are more than one method for doing Bayesian inference. Something called Markov Chain Monte Carlo is primarily what we use, and I'm going to describe, describe that in a little bit of detail later. Uh, it includes all those statistical distributions you'll need. That's kind of one of the things that it takes a little bit of time to learn uh, to kind of use Bayesian methods is learning all the different statistical distributions and, and when and where they should be used. Uh, it leverages a package called RVs, which kind of spun out of Python of PyMC years ago for doing lots of output analysis and plotting. Uh, it's very extensible, so if you find a probability distribution that we don't have, it's easy to implement your own. You can extend even the uh, uh, algorithms for fitting the models if you're so disposed. Uh, and that includes things like non-parametric Bayesian methods, which is another great aspect of Bayes that we don't have time to go into today. And we just released a new version. PyMC4 was released just a couple of weeks ago. We're very excited about that. Uh, it has uh, now GPU support. Uh, it supports different computational backends like JAX and Numba. Um, a lot more user-friendly than before and, and generally runs faster. So all the things you like to see in new versions of software. So I, I, Encourage you to try it out. We'll use it here in our, in our examples. Okay, um, I'm going to switch now to uh, uh, Jupyter Notebook. If I can find my way around my own computer. Uh, feel free to interrupt with questions, by the way. Uh, if anybody has, one, has them, I will, uh, can answer them while I'm switching. Yes? Uh, distinct, uh, the question was, among the different libraries, are there differences between what each of them has to offer? Um, I would say that the differences are mainly in terms of high versus low level. Um, you know, St Stan is probably the, the uh, market leader, if you like, and it's, it's, very, it's, it's, it's um, a little bit lower level than PyMC, um, and it's built really just to do Markov Chain Monte Carlo really quickly. Um, so, and, and it tends to be, uh, look a little bit more like R than Python. 
Uh, so it depends on kind of the interfaces that you like to use. Um, but um, you know, most of the main ones, you know, Pyro, PyTorch, they're, they're, they're all going to be used. And, and some of them have uh, placed emphasis on different methods for fitting Bayesian models. So NumPy or Pyro are, tend to be more towards the variational inference side, which is a, for bigger data sets. Um, so, uh, uh, so that kind of reflects that choice as well. Um, but they all generally do the same thing. It allow, they allow you to fit your model at kind of a high level where you don't need to know necessarily very much about the fitting algorithms and then uh, generate results for you. Yeah. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Um, well, there's not too much to say about the likelihood, right? So it's, a likelihood is really just another probability distribution. The only thing is, is that it's, it's and, and we'll see this in a second, it's, it's pinned to your observations, so they don't change when you run the model. It's kind of used to inform the rest of the model. So uh, mechanistically, in terms of how you specify your model, there's really no difference between uh, your likelihoods and your priors. Um, it's really just that the, the, your likelihoods have data associated with them. You can draw new values from that distribution, but they're just normal distributions, binomial distributions, et cetera. Uh, yeah, but the, the mechanism that you assume when considering one distribution over another mm -hmm. are different, right? So you can do consider a binomial that allows you to bootstrap. <coughs> so are there inherent methodologies to choose one over another? Uh, model selection. So what part of there's really three big steps to doing Bayesian inference. One is Write your model down, you know, specify all your probability distributions, whichever choice you want to make. Fit the model, which is what this talk is mostly concerned with. And then the third is model checking, and it's a very important step. And that's where you go in and you see whether your model fits the data. And if you've made a bad choice of prior or likelihood, that should show up in kind of bad goodness of fit tests. It's funny that you ask about the likelihood. Most people are worried about the prior. You're worried about the likelihood. That's great, because they're equally important. OK, so I'm going to quickly run through how to fit some models in PyMC here. Um, uh, we are going to uh, use more ba another baseball example to motivate this. Um, so this is, uh, hopefully my import, data imports will run in finite time here. Uh oh. All right, I'll talk while it's doing that. It makes me nervous that it's uh, running this long just to import. Anyway, um, so this is the stucky, sticky stuff incident. Uh, so last year, uh, baseball started cracking down on pitchers putting stuff on their baseballs. And why would they do that? Um, well, um, the pitchers try to get a good grip on their ball, on the ball, and uh, and spin it so that it'll create gener generate some movement, and the movement makes it harder to hit. So way it's been doing this in, in way as far back as baseball goes, which is well over 100 years, uh, putting stuff like pine tar and uh, uh, mixtures of, uh, of rosin and sunscreen, anything to make it kind of tacky and sticky. And uh, this caused a lot more strikeouts, which aren't as fun for spectators to watch. And so even though the rule was kind of in the rule books, they started cracking down in kind of the middle of last year. And you'd get, you know, a 10-game suspension and, and a fine and things like that. And, um, you know, just to give you an idea, uh, this, is what a, this is why they do it. So this is one of our pitchers, Aaron Nola, throwing a curveball. And you'll see right at the end it kind of dips. And it's because he spins the ball really quickly and um, uh, it makes it really hard to hit. And so they started cracking down, you know, very invasive uh, checks, unbuckling their belts, checking the insides of their gloves. Uh, nobody was very happy about this. And, um, and so what we're going to try to do here is try to estimate whether or not the uh, sticky stuff crackdown had an effect on the spin rates of baseball. So we, we, we uh, collect a ton of data now, Major League Baseball does. Um, every game generates six to seven terabytes of data. Um, because they monitor all the players on the field, the ball, the movement of the ball. Uh, and it's actually all available for free on the uh, MLB Advanced Media website, um, the StatCast website. 
And so I, I downloaded um, all of the data from 2021, the year where they cracked down, and uh, looked at their spin rates. So this is what the data looks like. Um, we can plot it. So here's the spin rates by date. Uh, the little gap in the middle is they take a break in July to uh, do the All-Star Games. So there's no games for a little bit under a week. But otherwise, continue it. These are all the pitches and the spin rates on each. So on average, there's about the 2,500 RPM. That's the spin rate of the ball with lots of variation. And so what we're interested in knowing here is, is there a change during the season in spin rate due to the crackdown, trying to avoid getting suspended, um, and does that change point uh, correspond to when the crackdown happened, which was, uh, let me say here, June 3rd was when the information kind of leaked out that they were going to crack down. So let's build a model for this. What is the model going to look like here? Uh, I'm going to extract some data. All I need is the date and the spin rate. So that's what these two lines is doing. And so the model I'm going to use here is a change point model. Um, and it's, it's a relatively simple model just to demonstrate how to use PyMC. And so the idea here is that the, really the simplest possible model is to have a constant spin, mean spin rate across the league. And at some point, there'd be a change due to this change in policy. So there'd be an, an early and a late spin rate. So what we statisticians would call a piecewise constant model, right? two pieces. And so mu1 and mu2 are the two rates. Tau is going to be our change point. And the tricky part here is that tau is not known. I mean, we have a guess at what it was if our hypothesis is true, but we really don't know what it is. And, and that's the nice thing in Bayes is that anything you don't know, you just put a probability distribution around it, and you estimate it. You include it in your model. And so that's what we're going to do here. So two mu's and a tau are our variables. And then we'll have two likelihoods. And these are going to be normally distributed. distributed um, with the two means, and then some common sigma. Maybe the variance changed afterwards as well. We're just doing a simple, I'm not saying this is a good model, this is just a simple model, and, and somewhat reasonable, uh, given what we're trying to do. Okay? So let's step through building this in PyMC. So we're, we're really, there are two different types of objects in a, in a Bayesian model, stochastic and deterministic variables. So mu1, mu2, the means, and the change point tau are all random variables. We don't know what they are. Oh, and sigma, the kind of noise, distribution of noise around the mean. Um, so they're aris they arise from a, a physical random process uh, that, uh, sorry, they're random in the sense that we don't know them. So that we, we don't think that the underlying mean necessarily is changing, except in a way that we include in our model. But we're using probability distributions to characterize our information state about that variable. Right? So it's an epistemic pro uh, uh, randomness here, not necessarily a, one that's stochastic. Um, and, and it's representing our uncertainty about these values. Uh, there are other objects that are deterministic. So given, in a given year, the rate uh, is completely determined by mu and mu1 and mu2 and tau. If it's on one side of tau or the other. Um, so the, the vector of rates for every day of baseball is going to be deterministic given those random variables. Right? So we have stochastic things and deterministic things. All right. So um, here's the rest of our, what choices are we going to give for our probability distributions? Well, our means are going to be uh, normal with mean 2,500 because that was, I peaked at the mean there. Um, and then a, a, a you know, a standard deviation of 100, which is a variance of 10,000. So way bigger than we need. Uh, uh, tau, I'll just say uniform between 0 and T being the last day of the season. And then a half normal distribution for sigma. It's half normal because variances have to be positive, right? You can't have negative variance. So we just chop the negative side off of the normal distribution. Uh, in PyMC, it looks like this. So a um, couple of things to note here. Uh, the with statement, we use a with statement, which uh, in Python is a context manager. And context managers generally are used for things like network connections, uh, file opening and closing, and it kind of manages all that for you. Here, we're going to use it to open and close a model and add variables to it. So it's a nice little trick that makes models easy to specify. So we're going to create a model object, which is really just a big container for our variables and how they're related to one another. We're going to call it spin rate model. 
And then here are our two of our priors. So here's mu. And mu here has shape of two because there's the early and the late. And then there's the uniform distribution right, with a lower and an upper bound that I'm using just you know, the first and the last day of the season, which I've encoded as integers from zero to big T. Does that make sense? Okay. Notice each distribution has a name. It's got a label, essentially. And it's been added, added to the model. Okay. Um, and in fact, uh, you can't even specify, you can't even use these random variables outside of a model. If I just say I want a normal called x with mean mu, mu 0 and sigma 10, and I try to run it, I get an error. I get an index error. But if you scroll down to the bottom, it says no model on context stack, which is needed to instantiate distributions. Okay, so the, it, it's got a lot of um, overhead associated with it that's, a, that's used for integrating that distribution into the model. And under the hood, um, oops. Oh, I changed the names of these things, so change this to mu. Under the hood, <coughs> uh, all of these variables are things called tensor variables inside the Asara library. Asara is the, um, essentially the um, back end for PyMC that does all of the heavy lifting, uh, particularly building the kind of model graph. Uh, it, was, it is based on Theano, which is a uh, uh, now extinct um, deep learning library. Uh, and we, uh, thanks to the efforts of uh, Brandon Willard and others in the Asara team, basically co-opted that package, uh, uh, that library, and, and turned it essentially into a probabilistic programming engine uh, and that allows us to compile it to different backends. So you're going to see a lot of mention of Asara. That's really just kind of the back end of PyMC. Um, all the distributions that you're seeing here are based on our subclasses of a distribution superclass, uh, in, in particular uh, the continuous subclass. And so every distribution, really all it needs to have is a uh, method for returning the log probability. That's what we use to fit the model. Um, optionally, a random method for drawing new random va values. It doesn't have to have that, but if you want to sample from your model, uh, you'll want to include that as well. So if you're implementing your own distributions, that's roughly how it, how it looks. Um, so for any of these variables, for example, tau, we can pass it a, you know, a value of 5 and, of, and uh, get the uh, log probability back. Right? So that's the log probability of, of a 5, you know, day 5 of the uh, season, essentially. Similarly, random is in, uh, you use that via the draw function. Right, so we're going to draw five values of mu. Remember, mu is of size two. There's two means, so it's drawing five sets of two in this case. Right? If you do want to use our um, statistical distributions outside of a PyMC model, you can do that. There's a class method called dist that just pulls out the statistical distribution. So here I created a normal called x of size 1,000, and then I... Uh, generated a histogram of that, right? So you can use them outside of PyMC. You've just got to uh, extract it in the appropriate way. And PyMC has a ton of distributions. Um, there's the whole list, right? So chances are what you need is in here. And if it isn't, I've just showed you how to, essentially how to do it, okay? Uh, every distribution has a shape. Remember, mu is of size 2. So there's, this is a univariate distribution, but it's kind of a batch of two of them, right? It's not a multivariate normal, although it could be, um, but you can have kind of batches of distributions like this. Okay, let's keep going here. So, the nice thing about the context manager is that you can, you know, add some variables, close it up, crack it open again, add a few more. So we're going to add sigma here because we had one more random variable. This is our our ob observation noise essentially, and and the model's keeping track of what's in it and and you know all of the details. So there's, those are the variables we've added so far. Um, and uh, PyMC is doing a lot of stuff under the hood for you here. Um, you know, um, for example, when you specify a half normal distribution, as I said before, it's constrained to be positive. But when we're doing est model estimation and the, we're doing MCMC sampling, um, we don't want to have to worry about that lower bound of zero. And so everything under the hood gets transformed to the real line. So uh, in this case, we're going to log transform it. 
Uh, so, you know, you pass a negative 1 to this. I don't know why this is taking so long. Uh, you get, it's undefined. Uh, it's not undefined at, in negative values. And if you look under the hood here, you'll see that uh, the name implies that something's happened. Sigma underscore log. So it's been log transformed. Um, but you don't have to worry about that. They inverse transform it when you get the results of the model. So you don't have to, it's really just something that's convenience for, for computation. All right, now deterministic variables. So deterministic variable, again, is, is anything that's completely determined by the value of its parents. So our vector of rates across the season is completely determined by mu and tau. And so this is it here. It's a little switch statement. When tau is greater than day in, so past the, the switch point, uh, it's mu zero, sorry, if tau, if it's the other way around, if tau, tau is greater than day n, so it's the first half of the season, uh, it's mu zero, otherwise it's mu one. Okay. And notice here that um, I didn't give this a name like I did with the other things, you know, maybe it was normal mu and then uniform tau. Um, this is kind of an anonymous thing here um, with no name associated with it. Uh, because this is sort of an intermediate calculation. I'm not really interested in this vector of copied values, essentially. And so, this, um, in, in this sense, they'll kind of be thrown away at the end of the model fitting exercise. Um, if you want to uh, specify something as... Uh, that's some bad color choices here. Um, if you want to specify something as... Um, uh, if you want to make it persist in the model and summarize it at the end, you have to wrap it in a PyMC deterministic object, and then you give it a name. Okay, so now this will exist in the trace that you get out the other end. Otherwise, you can just leave it uh, anonymously. And, of course, the shape on this is going to be bigger uh, because we are... Uh, so there's one for every pitch that's thrown here, yeah, 7,791. All right, last step, the likelihood. So as I said before, there's really no difference between stochastic and observed variables in the model. One just has data associated with it, the others don't. And so the way that you do that in PyMC is you pass the data to the distribution using the observed argument here. So spin rate are, is the vector of spin rates for every pitch. Otherwise, it's just a regular normal distribution. And so mu is r, so it's our vector of rates, and then sigma is the observation noise. Okay? And you can always see what your likelihoods are. Oops, haven't, haven't run the cell yet. There it is. Okay? You can always check what it is looking at, uh, observed RVs. And then uh, another step that's useful at the end is to actually look at your model. <laughs> and so you can generate a, a graph, uh, a picture of the graph using GraphViz. Um, this is always good, right? If you're building more complex models, I often do this, and I'll have like a, a node floating around unattached to anything, and that would cause problems. So just make sure that your model's all connected the way you, th you think it should be. Okay, and then now uh, we run this, and all we have to do is call sample. All right. Um, and I anticipate this to take longer than it should because something's weird with my computer today. Uh, so this is the... Uh, the magic inference button. This is a phrase coined by Thomas Vicky, who's here in this uh, meeting. He, he allowed me to say it. He's trademarked it, uh, but he let me say it. Uh, and, and so, well, this is the thing. I didn't give it any arguments, just to show you how easy it can be. So there are a lot of um, uh, defaults implied here, and we'll go into that in the kind of the next section. And so it will run this uh, in just a few seconds. Yeah, it should take way less time than this. Sorry about that. It took about two seconds the other day. Um, so anyway, you'll see what it says here. Auto-assigning nuts sampler. We don't know what that is yet. Initializing nuts using something. And then multi-process sampling. It's going to sample four chains. And it shows you the random variables that it's estimating. And then it's, it's running. is about 10 times as long as it usually takes. OK, and then we can generate plots of things. So um, one we're interested in here is tau. So the mean of tau is 68, although it's got a weird bim bimodal thing. It's maybe a little uncertain about where that is. The mean is 68. And if you look at 
where in the calendar 68 is, it's June the 8th, which is less than a week after they changed the regulation. So there's a little bit of evidence here of, of spin rates changing. Okay. All right. Uh, next, I'm going to dig into a little bit more into um, MCMC. So I need to unmirror my monitor. Yes, please ask a question while I'm... Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, we're definitely interested in how big it is. Let me see. Yep, yep. Um, so, oh, you can't see this anymore. Um, mu naught was 2,539, and uh, mu 1 was 2,442, so about 100 RPMs less, which can make the difference. It's a game of fine margins. Uh, all right. Go for it. Uh, well, once, once it's compiled, it's kind of out of PyMC's hands. So the, so the, the JAX is, so it compiles to C, which is what Theano gave us before, JAX, and then uh, a little bit of Numba at the moment. And, and so potentially more than that. Uh, and all it's doing is compiling it for the MCMC computation. So all the features are, aren't really relevant. It's just doing the gradient calculation and, and all of the kind of MCMC steps. All right, so we're going to talk about MCMC. This is the, um, so the main challenge in doing in fitting Bayesian models resides in actually calculating the joint posterior distribution over all of the models, right? And so, so this was the hard piece, right? Integration is hard. Now, if I was teaching my course here at, at Vanderbilt, I would spend like two weeks going through from the basic. This is kind of ranked in order of complexity all the different ways you can approximate a posterior distribution from simple but probably inadequate to getting closer and closer to something that's usable, right? We're going to skip ahead to the workhorse. This is kind of the de facto standard method now for fitting Bayesian models. So MCMC stands for Markov Chain Monte Carlo. So two pieces to that, Monte Carlo and Markov Chain. Um, so it's going to simulate a Markov chain. So Monte Carlo is just a fancy word for simulation using a random number generator. And uh, um, we're going to simulate a Markov chain uh, where uh, the function of interest, our posterior distribution, is its unique invariant stationary distribution. Lots of jargon there. First jargon we're going to break here is what a Markov chain is. So um, Markov chain is something called a stochastic process, which is just jargon for an indexed set of random variables. So it's typically indexed by T because it's often temporal, but it doesn't have to be. And it's Markovian. So the Markovian condition is, it's, all it says is that the probability of some variable, its value in the next time step, given its current value, the last value, all the way back to its initial value, is the same as the probability of its next value given just its current value. So essentially, the history doesn't matter other than right now, right? These are pretty common. Like, we play Monopoly, that's a Markov chain, right? You landing in Park Place in the next turn only, is only determined by the fact that you're, I don't know, on Reading Railway and not that you were in jail three turns ago or anything like that. The current state matters, the past doesn't matter. So it's kind of mild non-independence, if you want to think of it that way. It's very hard to estimate Bayesian models by drawing independent samples. So what we resort to are dependent samples, and we can get the same sort of result. It can't just be any Markov chain that we simulate here, though. It's got to be a special one. And the specialness comes from a property called the detailed balance equation. We want a Markov chain that obeys this property, and this has to do with balancing movement to and from different states, okay? Glossing over lots of complexity here, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of intuition about what's going on here. If it obeys this property, then 
pi is the limiting distribution of the chain, i.e. the posterior distribution. So pi of, pi of y, pi of x is going to be our posterior distribution. So anytime you see a new MCMC algorithm pop up, the paper will show that it's reversible. That's kind of the, the thing that you have to prove before anybody believes you. The very simplest MCMC out, so there's no such thing as MCMC as an algorithm. It's a class of algorithm, right? It's like bird. There's no birds called a bird. They've all got species associated with them. Same thing here. So one of the simplest ones is the Metropolis algorithm, and it's really easy. A couple steps here. That last one should be a four, not a one. Don't know why that happened. So four steps, all right? You initialize all the parameters of your model to arbitrary values, and then you have another distribution that's easy to sample with, from, and you draw potential new values for that distribution. You evaluate whether it's good or not, and whether it's good or not depends on the ratio of the posterior log posterior distribution under the new values, theta prime, over its current values. Okay. You, can't cap, you, can't, you don't really know what this posterior distribution is, but you can always, remember every variable has a log p in pi mc? You can always calculate the log probability for any value, so you can always do this. You have this acceptance probability. If that probability is higher than that one, you accept it all the time. And if you don't, you accept it probabilistically. You draw a uniform random variable and you kind of flip a coin. So you sometimes accept bad values, right? It's part of this reversibility thing. You don't just want to find the peak of the distribution. You want to find the whole thing. And so metropolis sampling kind of looks like this, right? So it's proposing values, sometimes accepting them. I can't remember who I stole this from. It was probably Thomas. Did I steal this from you, Thomas? No? no? Okay. Then I did it. This is mine. Um, <laughs> And, but notice it's getting stuck here. So this is a complex problem. This is actually a thousand-dimensional multivariate normal. So it's not complex, sorry. It's very simple. It's just large, right? It's, it's big geometry. And so it's kind of getting stuck. It's not doing a very good job here. Interesting. Well, the reason it's getting stuck is it's not very good. Um, Metropolis algorithm is not very good. It's very easy to implement. It's very general. Um, but it doesn't do well for larger models. And the reason is, is that uh, as uh, models get big, the volume in terms of the space of the parameter space grows exponentially. So that exponential line is the volume. The probability, or the uh, density, the probability density function is there. So as you move away uh, from the mode, the volume gets very big and the uh, density doesn't. So most of the probability is actually away from the mode. And so it's really easy to get stuck in areas of low probability. This area of high probability, it's hard to see it there, it's shaded, it's called the typical set. And that's what we want to do, is estimate the typical set. And to do that, we need a better algorithm. And the better algorithm is something called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is yet another MCMC algorithm, but this one uses more information about your model. Specifically, it uses gradient information. So Metropolis, we were doing a random walk, right? We were randomly drawing a new value. And as you might, sort of intuitively, that's not very efficient, right? Just random values, are they going to be good or not? Probably not. But if we use information about the gradient, we can get essentially better suggested values and do a better job. And so what this does is it simulates kind of a, a physical analogy of, of a particle moving. Think about a skateboarder in a skate park, right? And you kind of, you know, push your skateboarder into the park, and what, is, what does she do? She kind of rolls around following the topology of, of the park, right? Or a, a, or a marble in a salad bowl or something like that, right? Goes up and down. And so we do this to explore the posterior distribution. And so we add an auxiliary variable to simulate, essentially, well, position and momentum, or kinetic energy and uh, potential energy, right? And, and uh, in kind of discrete time, discretized time. Okay? And so it requires the gradient. And so derivatives, derivatives are easy nowadays on computers. Integration is hard. Dis um, derivatives are easy, particularly when you have a package like Theano or Asara or TensorFlow or... PyTorch, whatever, they all give you these things for free now. So we calculate essentially the changes in position and the changes in momentum um, and use that to monitor 
uh, where, the, where to go in terms of characterizing the typical set of the distribution. So you take all of these li little leapfrog steps. You're kind of following the contours of the posterior distribution. You stop, you take a value, and then you, you know, flick the particle in a different random direction. And so the algorithm's even, even easier than Metropolis. Sample a new velocity from a univariate Gaussian, i.e. your initial energy, perform a certain number of leapfrog steps to get a new state because you're simulating, a, you're using, it's a continuous system, but you're using discrete steps to approximate it. And then you do an, an accept-reject move because you're doing this approximation at the end and you accept it or not. And Hamiltonian MC looks like this. Boom. And it can even do more complicated things than multivariate normals. It can, you know, be those weird banana-shaped distributions with a huge ridge on it or whatever, okay? In fact, that logo at the very beginning, one of our developers, Colin uh, Carroll, did, and it was simulating the, the PIMC logo. So it can be super complex stuff. Okay? And then I'll skip right to the punchline. Is that, you know, when you saw, remember when I ran sample, it said initializing nuts? Well, nuts is a uh, particular uh, tuned, auto tuning version of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo called the no U turn sampler. It's no U-turn because when you, you know, when you do that moving around the space, what happens when you go up a hill and you reach the top of the hill? You roll backwards again. And you want to stop before you do that U-turn because you're just you know, recalculating the same values over and over again. So the no U-turn sampler, sampler is the state of the art. And this is why we use it. So this is the same 10,000 dimensional or 1,000 dimensional multivariate normal, just marginal two variables from that, and that's what Metropolis does, another MCMC sampler that nobody uses anymore, and that's what nut, NUTS does relative to just independent draws, right? So that's what we want to do, and that's why we use NUTS, okay? That's your, you know, this, this few minutes of talk would have taken like a week uh, in my class, so we've, we've glossed over a lot of stuff, but um, hopefully that gives you a little bit of, of intuition. Um, is there a question while I'm Moving back over. Uh, yes. How do you know how many leapfrog uh, steps to take? You don't, and that's why you want a auto-tuning algorithm. That's what NUTS does. Is it it, it uh, optimizes the number of leapfrog steps. It depends on the model, right? Simpler models. You, you want, to, you want to do as few as possible. The goal isn't to perfectly follow the path, it's to get a good point. And as you can imagine, the more steps you have to take, the more computationally intensive it is. So you want to take as few as possible. And so the NUTS algorithm estimates the optimal number for you. Yeah, good question. And I wish I could uh, mirror this thing again. Ah, oh, there we go. All right. Let's see, it's 11.54, I started out, I have a half an hour still, is that right? Cool. We may even have time for questions, although we're taking questions during it, so. Any, any more questions, by the way, since we're on schedule? Sorry, I didn't understand that, sorry, can you repeat it again? What is it? Um, oh, it? It's determined automatically. So, so there's two things, there's two components. So the position is your actual posterior distribution that you're interested in. Uh, and the momentum is the auxiliary variable that you're giving with this, with the energy. So, so your model, your posterior distribution is the position. So it's not using kinetic energy, potential energy. It's using position and momentum. And so the momentum is auxiliary. It gets thrown away and you keep the position. All right, let's dig into this a little bit here. Um, so I'm going to use another sports example, but I'll at least use a sport that most of you are probably familiar with. Uh, so Six Nations Rugby, uh, it's the, pre the premier European uh, rugby competition. Those are the only six countries that play rugby, I, I guess. Um, you could argue whether Italy plays it or not, but they participate. <laughs> and um, so we're going to, this example is on, a version of this is on our website as one of the examples 
So what we're doing is we're taking historical rugby data to try to predict the outcome of the next tournament, right? And uh, you know, it's probably not valid because we're using you know results from 2014, probably entirely different players on all of these teams by now. Uh, but forget that for the moment. And so we're going to take a whole bunch of historical scores and try to predict new scores. And we're going to do that by estimating latent variables, which is what Bayesian inference is good for. And the latent variables will be the strengths, the underlying unobserved strengths of these teams in terms of scoring and preventing uh, uh, points from being scored. All right. So this is all the data, a home score and an away score for every game going back to 2014. So our model here will look a little different. So again, you got to think about our unknown variables and our likelihoods and so forth. Uh, let's, in this case, start with the likelihood, work backwards. Uh, so scoring points, they're discrete. You can't score half points. You can't score negative points. So a Poisson is a reasonable approach here. Poisson distribution is a counting distribution. It has to be positive. The mean and the variance are equal. So as, as the numbers get larger, the variance gets larger. Reasonable choice for counting things that don't have an upper bound like a binomial does. Okay, So we're going to have two Poissons here. Home score and away score, or your, your score and your opponent's score, right? So two Poisson means, and then the means, in turn, will be determined by uh, a log linear equation. The reason it's going to be log linear is because the Poisson mean has to be positive, and the way to constrain that is to make it inverse log, uh, inverse log right? So exponential uh, of that. And so there'll be two pieces, alpha and delta, uh, uh, attack and defense, which is why I chose those. So, the attack, so for the away team, it'll be the, uh, the alpha, uh, I think I have that backwards. It should be the alpha, yeah, it should be the alpha of, of the away team and the delta, the defense of the home team. Oh no, sorry, this is backwards, this is the home. Sorry, home is gonna be the alpha of the home team and the defense of the away team. And then eta is a, a, a factor for home, home field advantage, right? You play better at home because all the fans are yelling for you and you sleep in your own bed at night and stuff like that. Uh, so some, some unknown factor, right? And then for the, uh, but what we're gonna do is transform those so that they're centered on the mean. So that centered on the, kind of like we did for the baseball, we center it on the mean. So this is gonna be the mean score of a rugby match. And then these are, the, so that they all add up to zero, these are going to be transformed. So they're a little easier to interpret. Okay. Oh, and then for the away team, it's exactly the same, but there's no eta, right? And then uh, the alphas and deltas are reversed. So it's the alpha of the away team and the delta of the home team. I hope that's clear. What happens if both teams are uh, away? Well, they can't be both away. Oh, I see. Yeah, then you, yeah, you could do it, right? You just leave the eta off of both of them if they're playing like, in the United States or something, right? I don't think that happens in Six Nations, though, so we don't have to worry about it. All right. Oh, I'm just going to explain this. Uh, it's just a, a pandas is, uh, factorizes my favorite pandas function. It essentially does what scikit-learn's label encoder does. So it takes a list of team names here, and it turns them into integers from zero to the number of teams. So it's going to it's going to turn it into 0 through 5 in this case, right? And uh, so one of the newer ver features of PyMC, it's actually not a PyMC 4 thing. It was available in later versions of PyMC 3, is that you can uh, specify the size of your variables in your model using labeled arrays rather than just integers. So I'm going to take my list of teams and use them as the coordinates. And then when I print out the results and whatever, it will have the name of you know, England, Wales, et cetera. On them. And so I put that in a dictionary, and I pass that to the model as the coords argument. All right. And another thing that I'm going to do that's relatively new in PyMC is I'm going to make my data mutable. What does that mean? Mutable means I can change my data. Why would I want to change my data? Well, I'll fit my model using, you know, as we do in machine learning, we fit our model using fitting data. And then I want to use this model, right? I want to say, OK, now that I fit my model, I want to see what Wales and England do next week when they play in Wales. And so I'll, I'll change the data, and then without having to rerun the model, it'll, it'll generate predictions for me. Right? So I have this thing called mutable data. So I'm going to change the home and away teams later on. So what it's really doing is, is adding it as a node in the graph. 
as a symbolic node, and then when it's symbolic, I can feed whatever values that I want into them. Okay, um, so next step, priors. What are my priors gonna be? Uh, they're all gonna be normal, right? We're dealing with uh, uh, rates, uh, sorry, um, not rates, but actually factors that have been transformed to the real line. So um, my home field advantage, eta, is just gonna be a normal with mu one, sigma one. Those seem small, but this is on the log, or inverse log scale, so they get blown up when you call exponential on them, so that's actually quite diffuse. Uh, and then mu, uh, so, you know, exponential of three is about 17 or 20 or something like that, and so that's a reasonable approximate mean for what a population, an average score is gonna be. And then uh, the alphas and deltas, and now notice I, I didn't call shape now, I called dims. And I just passed the list of the dictionary of teams to that. And so it'll make sure that it's got one for each team on attack and defense. Go ahead. Uh, how much keeping those parameters required to do science versus routine behavior? Um, it shouldn't really be science. It should be, pri it should be whatever. So you could give them uninformative priors. I, there's a thing in here called a flat prior that's just no. In, no it's not even a real distribution. Um, you really want to add as much domain expertise as you can. The only domain, I don't know anything about rugby. I, I work in baseball. So only information I know is what the scores kind of tend to be. Like you can't get scores of a million and you can't, they don't tend to be like one or zero. So I, I actually just peeked at the population and put the population mean in here. And that's a valid thing to do here. Because one way of thinking about your prior is actually the underlying population that you're trying to infer, right? Like that baseball player, right? I used kind of the population of all baseball players. That's a great prior because you know what that is. You don't know where your player is in that, but mine has got to be in there somewhere, or most likely. You want to allow for it to possibly be the greatest baseball player ever, but that's not likely to be the case unless there's lots of data to support it. Yeah. Oh, what I do here? Variable name eta already exists. Well, no, it doesn't. Oh, I hit it twice, didn't I? Must have hit it twice. All right. Okay, deterministic. So here's my transformation. So at.mean, that's Asara tensor. So you, you try to use Asara functions here when you can. It's got most of what NumPy has, all the important ones anyway. So there's alpha star and delta star. And then my model for home and away, just like I wrote above, mu plus eta plus alpha plus delta for home. Same for away except no eta. Likelihoods, remember the only difference here is we have observed, and so we're passing rugby data home score to the first one, rugby data away score for the second one. And um, I always like to strip out the pandas stuff and use the values. In principle, it works with pandas, but sometimes I get unexpected things going on. And again, we're going to look at our model again. And it's bigger, it's more complex now, even this simple model. And just for convenience, I'm going to wrap this all, the whole model, in a function so I can just create a new model whenever I need to because I'm going to intentionally do bad things with this model. Um, sorry, the colors are so bad here. Hold on. I'm going to go back to my... Is that easier to see? Uh, so remember I ran sample with no arguments before and everybody freaked out? Uh, it's because there's a whole bunch of defaults here. And they're usually reasonable, but it's always good to know what you can change. And there's even more than this, but these are the ones you'd change more often, right? So you want to know how many draws do you need? A thousand's a good, that's how many draws after the model's finished tuning. You usually only, for M Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, usually a thousand or so is good enough, assuming the model's converged. Tuning, for small models, thousand's also pretty good. I like to do two by default, whatever. Um, you, we'll, we'll see in a minute how you know whether you need more or not. Um, a lot of these things get auto-assigned, so the step means the MCMC algorithm, the step method, the way, and, and so it knows how to do a, a step of a particular algorithm. It'll assign them automatically uh, unless you want to override it. I'll show you how to do that in just a second. You can speci uh, specify initial values if you want to, uh, how many chains you want to you sample from, all of these things. I'll go through some of these here in a, in a second. 
So assigning a sampling algorithm, usually you want to let it do this itself, uh, unless you have a good reason to override it, but you can. So I can instantiate a Metropolis algorithm and pass it, and it'll do Metropolis sampling. But we saw that Metropolis algorithm isn't very good, so you wouldn't want to do this most of the time. Uh, the only way that, so under, under the hood, there, um, every um, distributions has a, uh, a competence associated, or every algorithm has a competence associated with it that says, I'm good at continuous variables. I'm good at discrete variables. Don't use me here. Um, things like that. And so it goes through when it auto assigns and determines the best, the ones with the highest competence score, and assigns it. So in general, continuous variables get the nut sampler. But um, those variables have to be continuous, right? Because it uses gradient information. And you can't take gradients of discrete things. So if it's discrete, you get metropolis. Sorry. And then a binary gets a binary metropolis where you can only assign zeros and ones. Um, OK? That's generally it. But there are other samplers that are available to you. Initial values, you can pass your own. Otherwise, it will use the mean or the mode or the median, depending on which distribution uh, you can sample to get it. Um, again, most of the time here, unless you have a tricky model that it can be helpful to specify an initial value, um, you can override it. Uh, by passing them here. So let's do a simple thing here. 500 draws with no tuning using Metropolis with an in initializing eta to be negative 1. And I'm just doing this. Oh, God. Any questions while it's sampling this really simple model for a short period of time? Yes. To monitor the data? Update the model with new data. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, well, you can predict with the model with new data. Um, but if you've got new data that you want to use to fit the model, you've got to refit it. I mean, if you want to be a, a really awesome Bayesian, you really want to like take your posteriors from the last one and use it in the prior. But that's harder to do than you think, right? Because you'll get a, sometimes a weird posterior distribution. And how do you turn that into a prior? If it's done a good job, all your posteriors are going to be multivariate normal, and you could just make them multivariate normal. So you could do that, but you kind of manually have to do that. Yeah. All right, it finished finally. Um, actually, it only took one set, so it's having a problem compiling, I guess, for some reason. OK. And uh, if we look at eta here, it doesn't look very good. So this is a trace plot from RVs. That's, those are supposed to be histograms over there. They don't look very good. Um, and then this is the trace, so this is the sequence of 500 values. And I didn't do any tuning on here, and I used a crappy algorithm. So this is what we expect, right? So they all started at negative 1, and they popped up, but they're not really in the same region. And there's four chains here, so there's four different lines. So it doesn't look very good. All right, let's do it for real now. And hopefully this doesn't take very long. So I'm going to do it. This is really the default. So I could have just called sample without any arguments here. Um, here we go. So it's auto-assigning, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, this is a bad demo. Sorry. It usually runs a lot faster. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run everything below here just to speed things up. OK? And look, ooh, you got some warnings here. The acceptance probability does not match the target, blah, blah, blah. There are five divergences after tuning, blah, blah, blah. OK, we'll see what those are later. So we try to warn you when things go wrong uh, as best we can. Pardon me? Uh, it should be close to 0 0.8, and it's not. So it's supposed to be 0 0.8, yeah. Don't worry, I'll get back. I'll get to it. But here we see estimates of alpha. This is the attacking strength. And so England's the best, as they are at everything, right? <laughs> so, and, and so there are four chains, and they all look the same, which should inspire confidence, right? They all started, and they all ended up at the same place in, in each of these. So they look pretty good. The countries are where we expect them to be. And then uh, defense. 
So it's flipped around now. So Italy is the worst, and now Ireland's the best. So these comport to um, what we expect. Mu and eta. So this is a posterior plot. So this gives you um, a uh, HDI, which is a probability interval. So there's a 94% probability, the true value is between those two points, and then its distribution. So eta is 0.24, mu is 2.8. Remember, these are on the log scale. So if we convert these, 2.8 is about 16 points. 2.8 plus 2.24 is about 21 points. So there's a home field advantage of 4.5 points, which I guess is reasonable. In American football, it's like 3 points, I think for home field most of the time. And it probably varies by country too, right? Um, depending on where you are. Um, these samples are stored use in a modified X-ray backend, so labeled arrays, which is pretty nice. Uh, and that's a class inside of the RVs package again. So you can see our posterior distribution has, you know, for each chain, all of the draws for each of the teams, they're labeled with names, so they're really easy to to use. Um, so you got your posterior in there, your log likelihood, sample stats for things like, well, we'll look at what some of these are in a second, and even a copy of the data in here. So inference data is one of the relatively recent innovations of PyMC that uh, makes things a lot easier. Uh, parallel sampling, you really want to do more than one chain. Uh, for one thing, you've, you know, all our computers here have probably at least four cores, if not eight, and um, you can, you know, it's this is all embarrassingly parallel. Every chain can be sampled independently of one another. So there's no reason not to. So by default, it takes the half of the number of cores you have available. Uh, so I got four automatically without telling it anything. In this example, I, I picked six chains and using four cores. So it did it, you know, partially parallel. And so you end up with, you know, n times c chains here. So this was for alpha, so there's six of them. So it's six by 100 by six is the size. And you, you, know, you typically want to combine all of these together uh, at the end. So kind of the last topic, we have about 15 minutes left, um, is an important piece. We referred to it earlier on. Model checking is very important. Uh, you, don't, you can get reasonable looking results, and it just could be complete nonsense. And it's hard to tell sometimes whether it is. There's two components to model checking. Convergence diagnostics, at least for MCMC. Did MCMC actually work? MCMC can work, and your model may or may not be good, but you at least want to make sure MCMC works before you proceed. And given that MCMC worked okay, what is the fit of the model like? How does it, does it make any sense? Does it correspond to what the data suggest? All of those things. So how do we do this stuff? Convergence diagnostics, the easiest thing is to gaze at the trace. Just look at it. That's what a trace looks like. So this is one run, that I call this bad trace, because I did bad things with it. Uh, what did I do? I only tuned it for 10 iterations, which was not very good. And you can see, you know, this is for two chains. They don't, they don't correspond very well. Um, you know, this kind of gets stuck in places from time to time. So it needs to be tuned a little bit more. A tuned, tuned one, you want to look for this sort of fuzzy caterpillar kind of thing going on over here, right? They, remember what we needed, what we're trying to look for here? A stationary, uh, homogeneous Markov chain. It means it's not, you know, the chain isn't moving around, the mean is staying relatively constant, the variance is staying relatively constant, that sort of thing. This is getting a little closer, but it's not even quite there yet. Remember we saw a warning about divergences. In fact, this is exactly the warning. I pasted it down here. There were five divergences after tuning increase target accept or reparameterize. We try to suggest what to do to resolve problems where we can. A divergence is when this Hamilton, remember Hamiltonian Monte Carlo was doing the leapfrog steps and then sampling leapfrog steps. And the leapfrog steps, we're trying to trace this continuous Hamiltonian system as best it can. Well, sometimes it does a poor job of it. So here are a couple where it's done a good job. So the true distribution here is the, this cone uh, of red and, and yellow. And so here it's wandering around nicely. There it's not doing too bad. And this one, it got launched into space over here. And it diver, it's way off in a low probability region. That would be a divergence. You don't need to freak out if this happens, unless it happens a lot. So we only had five in this case over 1,000 samples. I wouldn't worry about that. Um, uh, 
setting a higher target acceptance is one way of resolving this. And it, so what that will do, it will increase the number of baby steps that it has to take. And so, um, so that uh, the acceptance rate, so 0.8 is the default. It's a relatively good default. If you're having tr trouble, boost it to 0.9 or 0.95 or 0.99 even. It'll take longer to run, but you'll, you'll get let fewer divergences. Even better, reparameterize your model. It's sometimes a sign that your model is a little bit wonky. So um, then there, I won't go into what that means here, but reparameterization often works too. Um, with these um, gradient-based samplers, there's some information that you can get from those because of the energy. Remember, we're tracking energy here, momentum and so forth. And uh, based on, on uh, the estimates of the energy at each step relative to the overall energy of the sampling, um, you can estimate how well the algorithm has been, been exploring the posterior distribution. And it's based on this notion of a Bayesian fraction of missing information that, again, I will gloss over a little bit. You want it to be close to 1. And so, I don't know, those look close to 1 to me. There's no real good cutoff. But uh, the easiest way to deal with this is to do an energy plot. So this plots the, the transition, energy transitions at each step versus the overall marginal energy after fitting. And you want them to sort of overlap like they do here. Um, bad ones look like that, where the marginal energy distribution is way wider. And so it's saying that the transition energy just isn't covering everything. Okay, so that's a bad sign. I sometimes get like bimodal ones where there's two blue bumps on either side. That's a bad sign too. Uh, one other that's worth noting is something called, used to be the, called the Gelman-Rubin statistic. Now it's called R-hat or the potential scale reduction. This is essentially an analysis of variance of the traces, if you know what an analysis of variance is. It's comparing the variation within a particular chain to the variance between chains. And if they're the same, they should be similar to one another. If the, your chains are in different spots, the between variance is wider than the within. Right? So that's kind of what an ANOVA does. Um, and those should also be, and so, it's, so as um, it converges on the overall variance, the R hat will get close to 1. So all you have to know is you want your R hats close to 1. So if you call rvs.summary, you get a nice summary table. And your R hats will be over here. And look, they're all really close to one. So we're happy about these. So convergence diagnostics, done. We've got a, yes? The burn in? Yeah, yeah we call it, apparently we're not supposed to call it burn in anymore. We're supposed to call it tuning. So it's tuning for a th tuned for 1,000. And that's, again, uh, I usually pick 2,000, except for a really simple model. Back in the bad days of Metropolis, you'd do like 100,000. Uh, so it's, it's much better now. But you'll know if you need more, you'll, you'll have signs of lack of convergence. Yeah, in some cases, you just need to run it longer. That's, that's all. So goodness of fit, last topic. Goodness of fit. Um, you want it, you want, this is essentially a calibration check for your model. And... Um, the best way to do this sort of thing is to compare uh, the output from your model to the data that was used to fit the model. And really, you're, if you draw a whole bunch of samples from your model, uh, your data should just look like another draw from that model. Otherwise, you can't really claim that this is the data generating model, which is what you want. Um, the nice thing is, is that Bayes gives you an automatic way of doing this. Uh, and this is called the posterior predictive distribution. And this is it here. So f of theta given y is just our posterior, remember? And then p of y tilde given theta, p tilde are new values, right? Things we're going to sample from the data, given theta, and that theta has already been conditioned on y. Um, this is the predictive distribution. This is just our likelihood. We're drawing values from our likelihood. Remember, likelihood is y given theta as well. So we're including the residual uncertainty in our parameters and the stochastic sampling uncertainty of just you know, drawing from a binomial distribution. And then you integrate over theta, which sounds intimidating because integration's hard, but you get this for free already because you fit your model using MCMC. 
so we don't have to worry about it. So we can get this. All we have to do is sample from our, after fitting our data, our, our model, sample from our likelihoods. And so we have a method for doing that in PyMC. It's called sample posterior predictive. And it's going to, this argument here will just stick it back onto the trace. Um, sorry for the functional programmers out there, but it's just going to add it to that trace silently without telling you. And so we'll have a thing in here called posterior predictive now. And um, we can do plots. So there's, RVs has plot PPC. And these are cumulative distributions of draws from the model, which are blue. And their mean is uh, a dashed yellow line. And the data is a black line, which is kind of hard to see here. But, but that's a good sign too, right? If you can't even see your data, that's a good sign. If, if it was out here, going over here, we'd be worried, right? So these are good checks. The observed data looks like draws from the posterior distribution. Oh, got 10 minutes left. I lied. I had one more topic, making predictions. Because uh, I mentioned this before, right? Um, I can swap, out, swap in new data. So now that I've fit my model, I want to know when Wales comes to visit England, who's going to win? Uh, and I can do that. So, P, so I open my model again, just as if I was going to add more variables to it, except now I call set data. And then I, I set, um, I'm, all I'm doing, is, all I'm adding here are indices. I'm pulling out the index corresponding to England and Wales, adding one to home team, one to away team. And then I call sample posterior predictive. And then I pull out the values. And those are posterior predictive distributions of scores of England playing Wales, presumably at Wembley or something, right? So England's going to win, apparently. And, and, and what you can do is pairwise subtract, or not subtract, but um, do the, you know, calculate a Boolean for when the home is greater than the away and take their mean. And so this implies an 82% probability of England winning. But this is my, it's kind of a dumb, simple model. Uh, the one that's on the, our website uses a hierarchical model. I don't think that will help this here. We should probably change that. Um, that only helps when you have imbalanced data sets, really. Um, but the idea is the same. You can build a way more complex model than this, right? Theta could be more nuanced than that. It could have more information about the teams. It could have, we could use better historical information, somehow weighting more recent events, stuff like that. So you can always make more, in fact, I was doing like an individual-based one here for like the pitching model, right, where you had different pitchers because um, every pitcher is going to respond to the sticky stuff incident differently. Like this guy might have been cheating here, um, that sort of thing. So you can always build more complex models, but that wasn't kind of the point here. Um, you want to learn more? There's more here, including uh, a brand new course from uh, PyMC Labs. Um, Thomas Vicky's company, uh, they've got a course called Intuitive Bayes where you can uh, learn a little bit more about all this stuff. So if you're interested, uh, track Thomas down. Um, he looks like that guy back there. Anyway, uh, I have uh, five minutes left, I think. So a um, couple questions. Does uh, Bookmaker use Do bookmakers use PyMC? I know one that does. Uh, but I'm not allowed to gamble on sports because I work in for Major League Baseball. So. And then if like PMC, they only support for such difficult Bayesian... Uh, Do they use Bayesian methods? Probably a lot of them probably use machine learning, I, I would imagine. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing. I only know one that I know for sure does. But um, I would imagine that you would think this would be a good approach for those sorts of problems. Yeah. And the, sorry, the question was, do bookmakers use PyMC? And I... I know at least one that does. I can't tell you. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, the question was, if you have different samplers for different variables, how does that work? Do you do them at the same time or sequentially? Uh, PyMC will, will uh, so HMC happens all at once. You walk over the entire multidimensional space. Um, 
if I had a, a discrete variable in there, I would have a mixture of Metropolis and HMC, and it would do one then the other. I'm not sure what, which order it would do it. So it would condition on one. And it gets very sketchy when you do these mixed ones. I don't think there's been a lot of research into what that does to the convergence, because the, it'll change the geometry when you kind of modify the model outside of the HMC. But sometimes it works. I've done it a few times, and I've gotten good results. So from a pragmatic sense, it seems to work. Uh, I would imagine if you had a lot of discrete variables, it would be harder. But usually, it's like one variable that has to be discrete, and, so it, and it tends to work. So, but that's just based on my experience. Uh, maybe two more. Yes, one at the back. Yeah, it wouldn't be a strength. Uh, oops, it wouldn't be a strength of this. Um, I would see how it goes if, if there was a lot of data, for example. Um, but yeah, you might then look at tree-based models or something. Yeah. yeah. One more question. Yeah. Is there a natural way to distribute clients in the over a cluster of CPUs? Uh, a, a, a cluster of CPUs, not out of the box. It uses GPUs now under Jax. Thomas, can you answer that about clusters? So the answer was version 4.1 will help you more with that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I think we're done. So, but feel free to uh, talk to Thomas or I um, sometime during the conference. Hope to see you out there. Thanks a lot.